Hello everyone and welcome back to the Moe Gamer podcast after our Christmas break and my peculiar episode X that I fucked up the recording on, but uh, hopefully you enjoyed that anyway. <laughs> uh, me and Woody certainly had a, a good time recording that and catching up on a bunch of things. So uh, if you could get past the sound quality issues in that, I hope you enjoyed our conversation. Um, today I am once again joined by my good friend and regular podcasting partner, Chris Kasky. So hi, Chris. Hi, Pete. How are you? Happy New Year. Yeah, and Happy New Year to you too. Uh, so, how have things been going recently for you? Good, good. You know, it's post-Christmas, so I got a stack of games that is <laughs> so big that it's intimidating, and I'm now full of anxiety that I will never get to appropriately play all of them. So, yeah, things are back to a comfortable state of normalcy. Yes, excellent. Um, so today's episode, with it being the first one of the new year and us sort of getting back into the swing of things, um, we're going to be, uh, we'll talk a bit about some of the recent news, although I'm probably going to defer to Chris on that because I haven't really been paying much attention to it recently. It's spice. Um, yeah, it's, it's what you expect after Christmas really, isn't it? Um, but then we're going to probably spend quite a substantial amount of time talking about what we've been playing recently because it's been quite a while since we've got together and done that. And then our third segment today, we're just going to talk a bit about some of the things we're anticipating throughout 2019. So, let's kick off with the news then. So, what's caught your eye this week then, or this, well, this time around? I think the only really big thing since the last time we get to get, got together was uh, East 9 yes was announced yep so that's like the huge piece of news as far as i'm concerned that's like the biggest thing that's happened in the past couple weeks yep. so falcom has or not has announced east 9 monstrum Knox for the ps4 at least and um since the announcement a couple little details have emerged um basically in keeping with pretty much everything nowadays it appears to have a kind of a darker almost like a horror and gothic influenced theme yep um and it's actually focusing specifically on an urban setting a, a city yep. a city setting with kind of forest and ruins in the outskirts which is kind of cool um because that's something the series has never really done before um i'm hoping that the city is big like a lot of the, you know, a lot will be exploring the city. Maybe like there'll mm -hmm. be like a, a sewers dungeon or something. That would be really yeah. cool. Um, and we are also being promised a slightly older version of Adol, and people now kind of know who he is now. Like he's gained yeah. some fame, and people are aware of who he is as an adventurer. Yeah. Um, there so is going to be. Oh, go ahead. So I, I, I haven't played much. Uh, I, well, I haven't played these eight at all yet. But uh, I know you people are specifically. Um, sort of comparing this to E7 in a lot of ways in terms of the sort of uh, darker aspect and the older characters and so on. So I, I'm not sure how E8 ties in with that, but certainly um, sort of if, if you played E7, there's a lot of quite sort of dark stuff in there as well. So it's uh, people are sort of considering this almost as a follow-up to that in a lot of yeah. ways. Well, 8, eight, was, eight came before 7 in the timeline. Right. So it makes sense. Yeah. It slots into like a weird place. Eight slots into a weird place in the timeline. Yeah. So yeah, um, uh, there's going to be a new superpowers system, which are also apparently going to have ties to navigation as well. So they're promising things like movement-based abilities and things like wall running or being able to move as a shadow for potential maybe like stealth elements and stuff. Mm -hmm. So it yeah. sounds like continuing on from a lot of the growth that happened in 8, which was a spectacular game, they're really kind of exploring some new concepts and some new gameplay ideas here. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. They've sort of been experimenting a little bit with some of the environmental things since, uh, since again, 7. Yeah. Um, because there were a lot of the... Um, I think they were called artifacts in seven or something like that. They could basically give you various movement abilities, and they were elemental themes. So there was like a wind thing that would let you ride whirlwinds and get up to higher places and stuff like that. So you didn't have like a, a jump button or the ability to climb or anything like that, but you had a lot of these abilities that you could use to get around in various ways. So yeah, it sounds like uh, sort of an evolution of that system. Yeah. So yay, new ease. Yep very much up for that and i should probably catch up with ease 8 at some point <laughs> yeah me too me ease 8 is massive yeah it's it's like the biggest ease ever it's like you know ease games one of the reasons i've always loved ease games is because they were kind of bite-sized like you could polish an yeah. ease game off in like 20 hours or less yeah but 8 is huge 
Eight yeah. is more of eight is more of like a solid 40, 50 hour RPG experience if you dive into like all the side quests and exploring the island and everything. It's a tremendous yeah. game. Yeah, it's kind of been moving that way for a while. So sort of like the the, the first bunch of Ease games, so the, the various remakes of one and two, uh they're probably probably less than ten hours each, those ones. Um Oath in Felgana and Origin Origins and Six. Again, they're probably a similar sort of length. Um and then seven, um, uh, whatever the remake of four was called that I've forgotten. Um, uh, Memories of Kolkata. Yeah. Memories of Kolkata. That's the one. Um, yeah. So they started to get a bit longer and more substantial. There, lots and lots more in the way of side content and, and additional things to do outside of the main story. So, um, yeah, looking forward to this one a lot, mm-hmm. definitely. Let's see what else have we got. Just hasn't been a lot of major announcements. Just kind of like little trickles and tidbits of like release mm. dates. Um, f- that. Action RPG from Furyu Crystar um, has been confirmed for a Western release in 2019. Oh so yes, that, yes, that'll be interesting because that looks really different. Um, let's see here. Um, a fun snippet of news for old Secret of Mana fans: um, the character designer of the Mana series, uh, Shinichi Kameoka has revealed that his game studio brownies who was responsible for a couple of things in the past um they did work on uh the oh boy uh magical star sign series for nintendo and most recently they did that uh, mobile rpg eglia lost which a lot of people compared quite favorably to a mana game they yes yes they are now moving on to proper console development um, they've they're moving out of the mobile sphere and they're ready to start quote end quote a new chapter for the company which includes uh, proper console games so they're returning sure. back to that sphere. Um, I love their overall artwork and their kind of whimsical fairy tale kind of take mm, on, yeah. on visual presentation. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what they have in store. Um, no real news or announcements, but just hey guys, we're making a real game for you again. So can't wait to Excellent. get my hands on that. Yeah, I'm not very well up on his work, but like the, the the little tastes I've had of it along the way. Like I I think I recorded some video from one of the one of the Mana games a little while back for for something you discussed and yeah, the the art style for all those is just delicious. It's it's going to be nice to see some sort of pr- full on proper console games coming out of them as well. So, mhm. Yeah. Uh in a similar vein, the former president of Image Epoch, um which is um uh, for RPG fans, um a tremendously delightful studio that made a bunch of really pleasant niche RPGs back in the day. Um, but then they folded under after, um, after their last game on the, uh, the 3DS, which I want to say Stella Glow, I think it was called. Um, yes. Which was great. Um, but unfortunately the company went under and there was some kind of financial, oh no, what's going on kind of stuff. But the former company president, Ryoe Mikage, um, has come back and started tweeting that he is working to bring some of their former IPs that went under when Image Epoch went under, and he's trying to revive them. So we may kind of start seeing a revival of their kind of style, specific style of RPG very soon. Mm. Um, he's got a... He, ha- he himself has a company, Mikage LLC, um, for kind of some of the mobile stuff he's been involved in. And so now there's going to be some movement towards kind of reviving some of those IPs that we've never seen that were kind of in the gestating stage back in the day when Image Epoch was still alive. Yeah. Yeah, my contact with Image Epoch is, is fairly, fairly limited over the years, but... Um... I did enjoy Time and Eternity, which everyone else hated, apart from mm-hmm. one other person I found online who really liked it. But um, I enjoyed yeah. it, ba- but you know, I played it based on your recommendation, and I really liked it. Yeah, but um, that was that was a, that was a cool, interesting game doing something very different. I mean, it was obviously done on the cheap as well, which is, I think is where a lot of the criticisms came from. But it sure. was it was enjoyable. It had a good story. It had um, a really nice proper anime art style and not just sort of anime style it was proper anime hand-drawn animated sprites and characters and cutscenes and that sort of thing it, yeah it, it looked lovely i really enjoyed that yeah image um, of games have always come under fire for being cheap and that's kind of what they yeah. do they make yeah. kind of budgeted budgeted rpgs for anime fans basically like their, their work has never been like 
exceptional, but but mm-hmm. it's always just been good, cozy games. Um, yeah. Uh, the Seventh Dragon series is quite popular. We've only gotten one of those in the States. Yes. But those are very good games. Um, I'm very fond of the Luminous Arc series um, mm-hmm. on the D- original DS. We only got one and two. We never got three. And then Stella Glow is considered a continuation of that. I also really, really love Arc Rise Fantasia on the Wii. Which I feel like I've literally never met another human being who's played that. <laughs> no, I, I I haven't played it. I'm familiar with the name, but I don't know anything about it. But it's 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 one that I've sort of seen around a bit, but don't know anything about. So no, it's worth it. <laughs> it's very yeah, good. Yeah, I will have a look out for that then. So yeah, um, any more, any any uh, new titles with the same kind of development sensibilities as old image at Bach would be very welcome. So mm, yeah. very much looking forward to more news on that front. A um, little while ago, we talked about a really interesting mobile RPG that I had noticed called Another Eden, the Cat Beyond Time and Space. Yes. Um, which is a, to review, a RPG for mobile phones with a massive pedigree of cool people behind it. Um, most notably, um, the head writer from um, Chrono Cross, um, as well as Yasunori Mitsuda uh, from of obviously Chrono Trigger and Chrono Cross fame coming back to do music on this. Mm -hmm. So in a lot of ways, people have compared this very favorably to like an unofficial Chrono game. I mean, to the point, to the point where one of the characters is a cursed samurai frog knight, which (laughs) like, come on. Um, So this has now been confirmed for a Western release. Oh, that's Um, good. Which is great news. This was the this was the one with a really interesting sort of side scrolling art style, wasn't it? If I yes, am I thinking of that one? Yeah, it's got really. a, it's got a, it does a sort of Animal Crossing type thing where it sort of it sort of goes over the over the top of a globe or a cylinder or something like that. Um, yeah, I remember I remember pulling some video of that a while back and it looking quite nice. So yeah, it'd be interesting to see how that one turns out. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure I'll hate it because it's a mobile game, but <laughs> but maybe it'll get popular, and then uh, Arc System Works will make fighting games based on it, and Platinum Games will make action games <laughs> based on it. <laughs> you never know. You never know. Yeah. Strange strange things happen these days. There you go. <laughs> so, yeah, another Eden coming to the West. Uh, here's one for you. Uh, your buddies at Alice Soft mm-hmm. are expanding their enterprise to make uh, social games for mobile and online um specifically yeah. for adults <laughs> so who knows what kind of social game alice soft will be developing but that'll be really interesting to keep an eye on yeah i've, I've played a couple of um of 18 plus sort of uh, mobile slash social games if you're familiar with uh, nutaku um the, the the website that was set up must be a couple of years ago now um they, they started with just web-based um, sort of adult gacha games, basically. Okay. Uh, and, and there's a couple of them are actually really good. Um, there's one called uh, Millennium War Aegis that's basically a tower defense game, and all, oh, all cool. the stuff you pull in gacha, the units are your towers basically, and they have different um, sort of strengths and weaknesses and so on. So you plop them down on a map, and there's various paths around the place, and that, that was quite a good one. And also you can fuck most of your units as well. So. Oh, okay. Which is nice. Um, so yeah, mixed mixed feelings on this one because you know I'd rather Alice Soft do you know proper games, but uh, yeah. well I think they, they, it, they're not say, they're not saying that they're not doing proper games as well because uh, Eve Nickel Two is I think out now in Japan, um, uh, and it, it, if it's not out now, it's certainly coming soon. Um, I would have thought that will be coming west. Uh, we've got the other Rants games to look forward to here in the west as well, even though Rants is is finished in Japan now. Um, so yeah, they're they're, st- they're still doing stuff as well so i i imagine this will be a sort of a nice little earner on the side for them uh that will yeah. allow them to fund some other projects so if, if that's the case yeah i'm all for it yeah i as think it's they been... don't start exclusively doing that that's no fine. no i think it's been pretty expressly said that this this is an effort to fund proper game development yes like, to make these kind of cheap cheap money generator games so that they can continue to make the kind of games yeah. they want to make and in a more fiscally lucrative business model so yeah and that, more power that makes sense them. because on because on more than one occasion in the past they've had real sort of financial difficulties so like the the whole reason rants 5 came about and in the form it did was because of some of those real difficulties they uh, they, they tried to make that game three times before they finally settled on what they wanted to do with it um 
rescued themselves with uh, with Diakuji in the meantime as well. So um, yeah, they're they're no strangers to financial difficulties. So <laughs> so there's a good way for them to uh, avoid that happening again in the future without having to um, without having to sort of get extra creative. Then uh, then that's good. I say. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Um, what else? Um, we have a little bit of new developments for that new Vanillaware title, Thirteen mm. Sentinels Aegis Rim. Um, yes, this has all been very quiet for a while, hasn't it? Yeah. I mean, once again, it's a classic like Japanese trailer, so it's like massive amounts of text everywhere and like thirteen <laughs> seconds of game. It's like a, it's like a nine minute trailer, and there's like four seconds of actual gameplay footage. Yeah. Um, I still have no idea what the hell this game is in terms of how it's gonna play. <laughs> like what it's gonna be um but it's vanilla wear so i want it um but the big thing now is like yeah there's there's 13 characters that you're going to get to play as throughout the game so that's kind of the big new reveal right now um but once again i have no idea what this game actually is is it an rpg is it an action game is it a strategy game is it a side scroller i have no idea no yeah. idea um but it's vanilla wear so it's gonna be cool um, we have a release date now for the new Yoshi game for the yes. Switch. Uh, Yoshi's Crafted World, March mm-hmm. 29th, 2019. So that's yep. worth getting excited for because the last one was incredible. Uh, Woolly World. Mm-hmm. Um, and just another cool piece of news. The, the Humble Store um, now sells uh, first-party Nintendo codes for the Switch and the 3DS, which I thought was really, really neat. Yes. Because that may also one day open up uh, avenues for bundles and, and, and some good deals because they're always running really cool sales and stuff. Yes, they, they've done bundles on some other platforms before. I think they've done some PlayStation bundles in the past, and they've yes. certainly done mobile bundles. Um, so, yeah, there's no reason why they can't do that. The only slight downside to this at the moment is it's US only. So, like, I, I unless I set up a North American eShop account, oh, okay. I, can, I can't take advantage of this. But, uh, obviously, North America is a significant market, and there's no reason why that can't expand in the future. Um, but, yeah, we'll see. So, um, at the minute, there's, there's like, a, a pretty good... Um, sort of cross-section of games so you can get a bunch of stuff on 3ds including some of the older games so they've got things like pokemon blue crystal and gold on there as well as uh uh, sun and moon and ultra moon and ultra sun on switch they've got stuff like captain toad treasure tracker breath of the wild mario kart mario's tennis aces um so sort of a a bunch of of big name stuff it's all first party stuff at the minute but uh, i mean there's no reason that can't change in the future as well so Yes, a positive development, definitely. I just thought it was interesting in terms of kind of a dialogue we had a few episodes back about, like, hip, cool, new Nintendo. Mm -hmm. Like, five years ago, did you ever think Nintendo allowing um, another digital distribution platform to sell first-party game codes? Like, it's kind of really an interesting development to to track the way Nintendo's been opening up and kind of getting with it a little bit. Digital rich digital distribution is in quite a funny place at the minute i think because there's there's significant upheaval going on in the pc sector at the moment i don't know how much you've been following the epic thing at all not really i just i'm i mean i'm aware that epic launched their own platform and some people are like it's a steam killer but like i don't really i don't really know anything about I yeah, know they've so, secured some interesting exclusives or timed exclusives. Yes, that's that, that's probably one of the most interesting things about it is that I haven't been following it in any great detail, but uh, one thing that it's, it's quite difficult to miss is the fact that um, it is getting quite a significant number of exclusives, um, which is interesting because I haven't seen people reacting overwhelmingly negatively towards this, which is odd when you think back to uh, Ubisoft and EA doing this because they were basically doing the exact same thing with origin and you play um i think the main difference is that the epic store has has opened up from the very beginning as um as not just epic store it's it's another storefront that just happens to be run by epic um yeah which is not any different than steam no exactly um but at the same time i i'm a bit hesitant to jump on board with it because i I don't really want to be running multiple clients for all my game libraries and having to remember which one stores which game and so on i mean i I hate that i've already got steam and gog and then some stuff that is stored outside of both of them as well and it, it can just get really chaotic and disorganized very very easily um, yes there agreed. are solutions there are solutions you could put in place like you can use launchbox uh which is primarily intended for uh retro games rom files and disc images and that sort of thing you can actually load pc games into that and organize them that way 
which is uh, something maybe worth bearing in mind at some point if if you're in that situation um but yeah it's it's something i'm not entirely sure how to feel about at the minute and i don't think anyone quite knows what to what to think about at the minute there, there are some people who are sort of feeling very positive about it and saying that oh epic has got the, such this massive uh, audience base already with fortnite and so on but then i just want to go hey well hang on the people who are playing fortnite they are only playing fortnite because it's because yeah. it's that yeah. sort of game the people who are playing fortnite then they're, they're not buying other games because all they play is fortnite um so I'm not sure that's that's a great argument in favour of it, but uh, we'll see how it goes. I guess I'm not sure how Discord's store ended up going. Uh, I mean, it's it's still open, which is a start, and they they keep pushing it. So, um, so I'm not sure how how that's gone for them. I know Steam is Steam is still very much the de facto store for PC digital distribution, and to be honest, I don't really see that changing anytime soon. Even no. even with sort of recent upsets over sort of their inconsistent policies and so on. I know there's still weird stuff going on with with certain types of content getting banned and without the seemingly without explanation and so on so there's there's some weird stuff going on there as well but um yeah it's it's good to see nintendo in particular sort of embracing the idea of of outside processors uh, e- even if like they only have the one store on the console itself having different options for where to get codes to buy stuff on that store is is a good thing mm-hmm. so yeah. good stuff anything else you wanted to talk about news no news? i think that's it yeah, like you say, it's been sort of sort of dribs and drabs since Christmas, hasn't it? Which is, is what we expect, really. But uh, yeah, there's uh, a few exciting things coming down the road, so I'm sure we'll have a bit more to talk about them in the future. Very much looking forward to seeing more about Ease 9 at some point, but uh, mm-hmm. with this being Falcom, uh, yeah, that could be any time, really. <laughs> well, it's apparently 50% complete already. Yeah. Like, so it's chugging along at a good pace. Yeah, yeah. So, we we'll have to wait and see on that one. We'll also have to wait and see. I, I mean, there's surely little doubt at this point that it's going to come west. Um, we'll have to wait and no. see who it comes west with. Personally, I don't mind too much, but you know what people on the internet are like. and mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, let's not get into that too much. Um, anyway, let's take a short break before we have a discussion about what we've been playing recently. So, we'll see you in a moment. Welcome back. For our second segment, we normally talk about what we've been playing recently, and with it being quite a while since we've got together to chat, there's probably quite a few things to talk about, especially with new acquisitions from Christmas and such like. So, Chris, would you like to go first? Yeah, um, so I have been enjoying uh, Fist of the North Star Lost Paradise, uh, yes. which which is the Fist of the North Star licensed title developed by the Yakuza team. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is, um, and I mean this as a compliment, delightfully stupid. <laughs> it's one of the stupidest games I've ever played, and I love it. Um, Fantastic. So, um, for the old school anime fans out there, right? So Fist of the North Star is one of the most celebrated and kind of well-known classic shonen anime titles Mm -hmm. slash manga titles. Um, And it's basically just Kung Fu Mad Max. (laughs) Yeah. So you wander, you know, the the hero Ken wanders the wasteland of the post-apocalypse, beating dudes up with his special technique where um, he knows how to touch people's pressure points to make them explode and and that and that's kind of fist of the north star's whole deal is like it's gory and ultra violent because it's like it's it, it's famous phrases like you're already dead because he'll like fight mm-hmm. a dude and then like touch his pressure point and then like walk away and then the guy will explode behind him um so that's the combat <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> you uh you wail on dudes and their heads blow up and then you throw them against a wall and they explode and <laughs> It's uh, Excellent. it's cool. Um, I've always really liked the Yakuza games in theory, but I've kind of always bounced off them a little bit just because the mm-hmm. non-fantastic setting is a little boring to me. Yeah. Um, I just like I just am not that into being like handsome suit dudes. Yeah. Um. 
So what Lost Paradise has allowed me to do is really dig in deep to everything that's always intrigued me about the Yakuza formula, um, but in a setting and with a visual presentation that I find a lot more appealing. Mm -hmm. So you have your kind of open world town that you can explore and you kind of meet people and do favors for people. So there's side quests out the wazoo and um, they kind of gradually also introduce you to the mechanics of the game as you do the side quests and kind of acclimate yeah. you to the different things you can do. Um, in typical Yakuza fashion, there's multiple mini games. Um, there's a club management mini game with hostesses, which has kind of always been a series staple. There yep. is a bartending mini game. There is a mini game where you are the doctor in a clinic helping people, but <laughs> the clinic is also being assaulted by punks <laughs> while while you're helping people. So that be, it's like a rhythm game where like weird music plays and you have to like tap. To, it's basically like Hatsune Miku, like the the, yeah. prom, the prompts appear all over the screen and you have to press the buttons with the right timing, alternating between like making the punks explode to protect the people and treating the people at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's goofy and awesome. There's a big open like post-apocalyptic wasteland you can explore with a, mm -hmm. a dune buggy that you can build and customize. Um, there's then racing for the dune buggy. Uh, delightfully, the music that plays for the dune when you drive into dune buggy for its radio um, is like classic Sega music. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So, so like when you s start you get like one of the fist of the north star classic themes but then another one of the themes you get is the original super monkey ball theme <laughs> so, so, so i've been like cruising around the wasteland doing like sweet jumps off of like <laughs> off of like rocks while like the funky super monkey ball theme is playing and uh, whenever it ends and it wants to move on to the next track, I'm like, not so fast. <laughs> and like, it's just like, and I was pretty hooked on the Super Monkey Ball theme for a while until I found a treasure chest and got the Fantasy Star Online theme. And now, oh my God. so now I'm cruising that. So I don't know. I just I, I'm really loving the hell out of this game, and uh, it's completely derailed me from Dragon Quest XI, which was like what I was, <laughs> which is what I was playing. But like I'm just having too much fun being like this big stupid muscle bound doofus, like making people explode all over the place, and mm. then and then going and being a bartender and like listening to people's problems, and and shaking my PS4 controller like a martini shaker so fast <laughs> that I think my couch is gonna break so that I can achieve S rank, and then and then you deliver the drink and they have like stupid dramatic like fist of the north star names <laughs> so it'll be like rising sun death in a glass and then, and, 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 and like the and, like, the announcer says it it's it's just it's just like ridiculous this sounds great um how much do you need to know fist of the north star before you play no, it because nothing it, nothing at all no That's you just good. you just need to be aware of what fist of the north star is all about yeah, which I've just explained to you. So, you have, yes. Yeah. So, so no, you could totally pick it up. Um, I don't really know anything about Fist of the North Star either. Interestingly enough, most of my exposure to Fist of the North Star as a property comes from exploring it as games. Yes, like I've never really watched the um, the anime, the original anime. I've never really read the manga. I've just kind of been aware of it stylistically uh, as someone in, who's into anime history. Yeah. But um, really, I've just played like. I have the Genesis game, mm -hmm. like that was there was a Genesis game that was localized in the West, not as Fist of the North Star. I can't remember what it was called now. Was that the one that was Last Battle? Or Last Battle. Yep, Last yeah. Battle. That's it. So like that, like I'm more aware of it just as a historical thing. So like I'm I'm by no means like a super fan of the franchise. Yeah. But you can oh, dive good. right in. It explains everything to you. As oh, you that's play. good. Yeah, my, my my sole exposure to the series is is a combination of, of the older games. I remember discussing with someone there was there was an NES game, I think, uh, where it had a music loop that was literally three seconds long, and it played for the entire game. Yeah, that's so, how last. So you were playing it, and you just go do 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 do, and then it just does that over and over again for the entire <laughs> game. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and my other, my only other exposure to it is 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 memes because yeah. Fist of the North Star is a very popular one for people to meme on. So, yeah, the the very famous one, of course, is Roses are Reds, Violets are Blue. Omoi wa Omoi wa Moshi Devru. I butchered that pronunciation, didn't I? Say, so, but there we go. So, the original Japanese for uh, you are already dead. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, um, you, and if you do the combos right and stuff, you get to hear that like every 30 seconds in the game. Excellent. Or, also, gonna, like, you've got about three seconds to live. And like, I can't, <laughs> like, I don't, I can't bring myself to put the Japanese voice track on because like, the English is so cheesy and delightful <laughs> that it kind of fits into what I expect from Fist of the North Star. Yeah, I, I was kind of thinking this recently because I was, I was sort of, um, I was playing Warriors of Ruchi for my uh, Wednesday video series. And I was just thinking, because I also recently got a review copy of Dynasty Warriors 8 uh, Extreme Legends on Switch. Oh, exciting. And that, uh, and that comes with the, the option to put the Japanese voices on. So I, I tried playing with the Japanese voices. I just felt wrong. It yeah, felt no, really wrong. No, I don't want ever want to play Warriors <laughs> with Japanese tracks. For, first of all, because you can't, you can't be bothered to read those text blocks when they pop up. Yeah. You just can't. Um, yeah, no. Wor- worry should be all about people turning up with big mustaches, going, "How do you like my halberds?" <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's great. Now I'm really we were talking about it the other day, but I'm really hoping that the West gets that um, revised edition of Samurai Warriors Four. Yes, it has yes. like 150 DLCs on it. It's like ridiculously <laughs> massive. Now there's been like three releases of Samurai Warriors on PS4. I think there's Samurai Warriors Four. Samurai Warriors 4, 2, and Samurai Warriors Spirit of Sanada. Does it just combine all three of those together? Um, I don't think... Uh, Spirit of Sanada is a separate game. Yeah. Um, it's not an expansion of... But I would think it probably would combine 1 and 2 and and, and mm-hmm. add all, all the D- DLC, I, I think. Yeah. That would be a beast of a game in that case, even without the uh, Spirit of Sanada. So, yes, hope we see that. Um Again, that's one of those ones I'll be surprised if we don't see, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, yeah. The uh, question for me is, is it going to be physical or not? That's the only Mm -hmm. thing that I'm questioning. Yeah, yes. Yeah, the the release of Dynasty Warriors 8 on Switch seems to be digital only, which is a bit of a shame. But uh, uh, Warriors Orochi 4 got a physical release, though, so you Mm -hmm. never know. Yeah. You never know. I'm waiting on a... I'm going to sit and wait for an expanded version of that one. There's always inevitably an expanded version of a Warriors game, Mm. so... Yes. But I do want that badly... Because as we discussed, it <laughs> has passed the world record for <laughs> most playable characters in a Muso game, essentially. Yes, yeah, I, I I'm really enjoying just the first one. I mean, the the amount of playtime I've already got out of it, just for the the videos, and how much more there is still to unlock. And the original Warriors of Rochi is the simplest, so like there there is no sort of there's no sort of fancy modes in the first Warriors of Rochi. It is just the story mode and the free mode, but there's still so much to do in that game. Yeah um yeah it's, it's ridiculous it's it's a game I, I love just just sitting down and playing just when i feel like beating up some dudes well i mean so. uh i know we talked a little bit briefly but i don't think we ever really discussed it on the podcast but like since i got uh i recently got a new television and uh uh-huh. it it finally had enough hdmi ports that i could have my um my frame meister xrgb mini upscaler permanently hooked up to the tv yeah. So now I've been playing PS2 games a lot more recently, and mm-hmm. uh, and one of those, for some reason or another, I've been tinkering with the original Samurai Warriors quite a yes. lot. I don't know yes. what compelled me to do it. Probably just watching you play Arachi so much, but um, even that game has you know probably the fewest amount of playable characters since the original uh, since Dynasty Warriors two, and it uh, you know maybe maybe twelve characters I want to say. Yeah. And yeah. still, I've got like fifty hours into it. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Like, it's always been the joke that like D- D- Dynasty Warriors and Samurai Warriors titles they never needed to get bigger. They've always been massive, <laughs> even from the get go. But they just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I, I'm having a blast with it. Just it, it's got the same sort of joy that like uh, action RPGs have to it. So I, so, I mean, there is loot and stuff in Warriors games, but just sort of the whole sort of meeting specific conditions to unlock abilities and stuff. I'm I'm really enjoying that. And there was um, unlocking Lady No in Warriors of Rochi is something I spent a good two or three hours on the other night just because there was there were some very exact conditions I had to fulfill in order to mm-hmm. unlock her in this in this one mission. It was a, it was a mission that I thought had gone suspiciously easy in the video I actually recorded of it uh, and then I, I i looked it up and it was like oh no you need to do it like this to get lady no and i was like oh shit yeah, wait, <laughs> wait till you start trying to unlock everybody's ultimate weapons yes that's always yes. like the worst yes so it's still gradually working my way through that uh, i need to decide how i'm going to handle uh dynasty warriors 8 um on switch as well whether that becomes a sort of companion parallel video series or i do a an article on it or uh 
well, well we'll see i'll figure something out but there, there will be some sort of coverage of that in the near future as well so i've had a quick look at it and the switch version seems to perform quite nicely even in handheld mode so looking forward to fiddling around with that yeah. a bit i mean it is technically a ps3 game yes so. yeah I remember actually wanting to buy the PS4 version and not buying it because I was like pissy about how like foggy and bad it looked. It was there were some enhancements for the uh, for the uh, PS4 version I think because people also got really pissy about the PC version being based on the P- PS3 version rather than the PS4 version. Ooh, that's different. So there, yeah, so there are some there are some enhancements for the uh, for the later consoles, but but again, it's Dynasty Warriors. You you're not really there for the for it looking good. You're there for uh, chopping up dudes. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. But I do like a good draw distance in my Muso games. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's like the um, you know we we often come back to talking about how much of a deliciously perfect game Hyrule Warriors is. Yes, and like yes. part of why I love it so much is just that the draw distance was incredible. <laughs> like yeah. it was just like a big big open thing. You know. Yeah. Yeah, that game just handles hordes of enemies perfectly. I, I think better better than any Musa game I've played to date. Just the the sheer number of things on screen in that game at once, and and the game just just taking it and not breaking a sweat, even in handheld mode on Switch. It's it's a delight. It really is. All right. Um, so what have I been playing? I have been mostly playing Atelier games recently. Uh, so at the time of recording, uh, I have uh, finished Rona. I have finished Tottery uh, with the normal ending. Uh, not the true ending, and I'm currently playing Meruru, and I love these games so much! <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Um, yeah, so my backstory with Atelier, um, the the PS3 versions were... Um, I acquired them a little while after um, I sort of really got into playing Japanese games and so on. Like like some of the earliest PS3 RPGs that I picked up were after someone I know online who who now writes for the Well Red Mage, I believe, if um, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah, she recommended uh, Neptunia to me in the first place, so it's her fault. This is all her fault. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it, at the same time, I, I, I got hold of Neptune and decided I really enjoyed it uh, and wanted to pick up more games in a sort of a sort of similar ilk from the PS3 era. And also around the same sort of time, um, this was when our main UK retailer of games, uh, Game, was uh, going through some real financial difficulties. And they were closing down a lot of stores and they were selling off a lot of old stock. And so you could walk into a game and you could pick up like an armful of games for like 20 or 30 quid. Um, And so I took full advantage of that opportunity. I went into our local game store and came back with an armful of PS3 and Xbox 360 games. Many of which I still haven't played. uh, But I got them for like a pound or two pounds each. So I'm I'm not too worried. But uh, that was when I acquired all of the uh, Atelier Ireland games for PS3. Uh, I played Rorina, the first one. Uh, really enjoyed it played it several times did some new game plus got several of the endings uh, then for whatever reason i never played the second two i never got around to them because uh, there was there were always other things that i was playing at the time or writing about or uh various things like that i finally got around to playing them with the new switch uh, dx versions which are basically ports of the plus versions that were on vita and uh yeah really really loving them and i'm really impressed with how each of them is offering a unique experience rather than being three games that are basically the same and so um rorana is uh very excuse me drinking coke and belching um rorana is very focused on um these short-term assignments so in the game you've got three months at a time to you have to either turn in a bunch of items under a set of specific conditions or in a couple of cases there are sort of go and clear out the enemies from this place but the, in in the case of that kind of thing there's usually some sort of alchemy based uh, solution as well so like this one goal you have to achieve is um the nearby forest has got overrun by vultures and so you can go in there you can fight all of them uh, or you can make some sort of vulture repellent using alchemy and then just clear them out that way instead so there's there's usually several ways to uh, achieve your goals in that one and uh, you get various endings in that according to whether you triggered various events with the different characters which is tied to the relationship system in the game um, and so you build up relationships by taking people with you on quests and fulfilling requests for them in town uh, and then the ending you get is de- dependent on a few things it's dependent on how well you fulfill the assignments throughout the game and your friendship level with various characters and whether you saw all their events and so on so 
Um, it's designed to be replayed several times because it, it's not possible to get all of the endings at once. You can only get one of the main endings and one of the character endings at once. Oh, okay. Um, although Plus and DX did add an option where if you meet the conditions for several of them at once, uh, rather than them having a weird priority like they did in the original PS3 version, you can now just choose which one you want to see. So if, if you have actually played the game in such a way that you've unlocked the conditions for several endings at once, you can save just before the end of the last assignment uh, and then just reload and watch the different endings that way if you want to as well. So that, oh, that, nice. that was quite a nice addition into, into Plus and DX. Um, Tottery is very different. The subtitle of that one is The Adventurer of Ireland rather than The Alchemist of Ireland. Um, and so it starts off with very much like Rorana. So you uh, are a young girl who's learning alchemy, uh, how to craft and synthesize items. But her her motivation is very different. So in Rorana's case, she is attempting to sort. Of, she's acting as an apprentice in an attempt to pay off a debt uh, that she has. Um, in Tottery, she wants to know what happened to her mother. Her mother was a famous adventurer, and she just left one day and disappeared, and no one knows what happened to her. And so the main concept of Tottery is just um, Tottery becoming an adventurer, traveling around the country and trying to figure out what happened to him. So in that one, there's no short term goal whatsoever. You just have a very long term goal. So towards the start of the game, she acquires a license to become an adventurer. Uh, and they basically say, right, you've got three years to rank this up to a sufficient level that will renew it for you. Uh, and when you've done that, you then reach a point where um, you get the opportunity to build a ship and then you have to get across the ocean before the, the final deadline expires. Because if, if you don't get there before the final deadline expires, she just gets completely demoralized by the whole thing. People start telling her, oh, you'll never find her. And she just gives up at that point. So there is there is still a time limit even once you meet the main objective. But it's, um, yeah, the, the actual thing you need to achieve is, is relatively straightforward. So there's no real sort of final boss or anything like that to to get the normal ending you just have to reach a specific point on the map because that's where sort of the answer is um but the interesting thing is uh, after you reach that point there is still additional stuff there is stuff that carries on after that there is additional things you can find out and learn and a big part of getting the true ending in tottery is not only proceeding past this initial ending and finding out what was going on it is following all of the other characters arcs to their conclusion as well because each of those has their own little way it ties into the story of her mother oh okay um and so getting the true ending that one is 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 significantly more challenging than in Rorana because it basically just means that you have to do everything and so oh, that's wow. uh, that's one that i'm looking forward to revisiting at some point but i can see that being a big challenge um and in miraru the third one which i'm playing at the moment uh, the focus again is very different so in that one you're playing a princess of um, a, a very small rural kingdom called Arles which is uh, adjacent to Ireland which is where the first two take place and Arles is preparing to um, sort of merge with Ireland in the near future and before that happens they want to build up the kingdom as much as possible and make it sort of full of people and productive and doing that sort of thing and Meruru the princess initially isn't very interested in this whole idea um that she's interested in in alchemy because she, she met tottery a little while ago got interested in what she was doing and decides that this is what she wants to do with her life and so obviously she meets a bit of resistance from her father's big with it she calls him a poopy head uh, <laughs> there's there's <laughs> there's uh, there's all sorts of tensions between them but um between her and the uh, the terrifying looking butler from the castle they come up with a plan that she might actually be able to use alchemy to help the kingdom and so from that point um you are then um fulfilling various objectives around the map making use of alchemy getting into fights and stuff like that uh, but the the main difference with this one is that everything you do has a very obvious and visual effect on what's happening in the kingdom and so there's a lot of sequences where the objective is uh, go to this map and defeat all the enemies and the the side effect of that is you do that and then people will come along and they will build a path through there and it will become more civilized in that area because you've cleared it out of monsters mm. And then there's bits where you have to sort of deliver materials to to people and uh, you'll get sequences where like uh, some old ruins become a big old fort and that sort of thing and so so far it's been a real pleasure to sort of see 
um, this kingdom building itself up as a result of your actions throughout it. And it's it's a different focus to the other two, but it's it's been a real pleasure to play so far. I love and, stuff uh, like that. It really sounds close to that aspect of um, Xenoblade Chronicles X we both loved. Yes, which yes, was very much. kind of watching the settlement develop as a direct result of your actions and like being rewarded for your patience and sticking with the game by watching that genuine progress unfold right like yeah go on a quest to clear an area out of monsters near the lake and then 15 hours later there's a water treatment plant on that lake making yes. fresh water yes. for citizens like i love stuff like that i love to feel like my contributions to the game world are having a real positive impact yeah because i don't feel that way in my real life ever so <laughs> so, so it's delightful yeah this is something that th the three Atelier Island games do really well. I can't speak for the rest of the series because I haven't played it yet, but um, the Island series in particular are very good at this sense of, um, of of creating a world that feels like it's sort of going about its business, and you you are part of it. You're you're not necessarily the most important thing in it, but the things you are doing have an effect. But at the same time, things happen while you're not there as well, mm. and so so you you're sort of. Um, so uh, I think Tottery is probably the best example of this one because in that one you're going back and forth between the the little rural village where she grew up and Ireland, which is a big city. Um, and so e each time you go back and forth, there's sort of been various developments that have happened while you've been away, and there's sort of this ongoing drama between like the the the, the coach driver in your village really fancies Tottery's sister, but he never wants to actually talk to her and that sort of thing. So. Um, and you go back to Ireland and there's these various characters developing relationships with each other while you're not there. So there's, um, there's sort of the girl who runs the guild adventurer desk is uh, sort of scared of scared of the person who runs her job, which is Cordelia, who I covered on the on the site the other day. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, she's scared of Cordelia. So she keeps going and, and complaining to the um, to the sundry shop owner, who's this nice older woman, this sort of motherly lady. And they end up going drinking together, but the motherly lady doesn't hold her alcohol very well, so she ends up sort of um, getting a bit handsy with everyone. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it's just a delight. It's it's just a, just a feeling that every character in this, whether they're sort of main protagonist or sort of minor side character, there's a real sort of um, I don't know. I almost, I almost want to call it a sort of soap opera type thing going on there, mm -hmm. where there's there's a feeling of relationships and things going on, and different characters have different stories that don't necessarily directly involve the protagonist, but you 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 get interested in them and care about them anyway. It's quite a small ensemble cast as well, so despite the scale of the adventures that uh, Tottery and Meruru in particular go on, um, it, it's got a very sort of small scale personal feel to it as well. So it's yeah. You feel like you're really getting to know everyone, and that's that's just a delightful feeling, really. Yeah, I mean, super tempting. Like, like uh, this stuff all sounds like stuff I really would love. Yeah, as as we've talked about um, offline, sort of the main stumbling block for a lot of people with Atelier is the fact that it it, it is timed, um, and there are. It, it, in order to get the best results in the game it is quite strict on what you need to do how you need to do it how you need to uh, sort of efficiently manage your time and so on um and in a lot of cases as well you really need to pay attention to things as well because often it will sort of mention something in a really throwaway way in a conversation and sort of say oh in a couple of days we'll go out drinking or something like that if you're not there literally in a couple of days you will miss a whole event you'll miss a bit of story you'll miss a bit of characterization and so um i like that other people don't uh other people don't like the time pressure and so yeah bear that in mind if 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 it is a series that you you think it, it sounds interesting bear in mind that you are going to have to deal with time limits you are going to have to deal with the fact that uh in tottery in particular it's quite possible to think you're doing perfectly fine throughout the whole game and then suddenly reach the final deadline and it goes nope <laughs> from what i understand <laughs> Um, and I've been doing quite a lot of research into this because I'm really keen on like 80% of what these games are about, but not, yes. not keen on the timed aspect, but it really only sounds like the Arlen trilogy is super strict. Yes. Um, the dust the, the trilogy seems to be much more, um, open. Um, the first game in the dust trilogy, Shally straight up has no timed elements whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, the other games in the Dust trilogy have timed elements that are very, very um, 
like loose like oh yeah. you 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 have six months to pass the exam and then mm-hmm. like once you pass the exam there's no more timed elements like it's so it sounds like they've really loosened them up and i think the mysterious trilogy which is the ps4 trilogy is the mm-hmm. same way i yes. think i think the feedback against the arlen trilogy was was pretty widely received is that it, it was just a bit too strict Mm-hmm. So I, I think I may just skip the Arlen trilogy altogether and maybe just dive in right away with the Mysterious trilogy. Yeah, yeah, that's that, that's fair, I think. And um, yeah, I mean, I mean, a lot of the things we're talking about here are things that have subsequently been built into these later games as well. I think the Mysterious trilogy is probably the one where they got most experimental because I know uh, Ferris in particular, the second one of that trilogy, they sort of experimented with making a more sort of um, almost an open world design with it rather than, because the, the, the previous Atelier games are very much split into discrete areas and mm-hmm. dungeons. Like and, a map and, screen and feels, you select yeah, where you go. Yeah, like a map screen and going between discrete areas. I think Ferris was an attempt to sort of go a bit more open with that. Interesting. I don't know how, I don't know how they did, handled Lily and Suelle after that because I know that Ferris had sort of mixed reception to that aspect of it. It wasn't bad as such but uh, i think some people some people thought that it could either handle it a bit better or it wasn't sort of quite right for the series or whatever say so. but like i say i haven't played those particular installments yet i so remember I, sophie I will, I will getting get to them. quite glowing reviews yeah 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 oh. so as far as i know all, all of the recent ones are, are very well regarded the dusk trilogy people people very much like the characters in that as well so there's some very some of the most popular characters in the series and fan art you see from the dusk trilogy and so on mm-hmm. there's um what's her name um will bell yeah i was just gonna one. that's it's, the girl with the big one. wizard hat right like yes that, that's totally yeah. my jam like she's so cute yeah and i think it's um one of the characters from is it Escher and Logie, I think. The girl with the pink hair and the bunches. I think she's quite a popular one as well. Um, but yeah. Yeah. So, I tell you, it's good. <laughs> um, cool. All right. So, what else have you been playing recently then? Well, I think I can speak for both of us when I say that Diablo on the Switch mm, has yes. been a, a treat. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, been enjoying Diablo on the Switch quite a bit. Um, I had never played the console version of Diablo 3 before. No, I did, me neither. I did not play the PS4 version. I had taken all the reviews to heart. I mean, a lot of people had said that really the console versions are the definitive versions. They're the most fun to play. The dodge feature is really nice. The menus were, are revamped for analog in a way that feels intuitive. And, you know, the always online feature being gone is delightful having your character saved on your console or memory card or what have you without having to worry about server status at blizzard is delightful um and i can now having played a console version of it i I can honestly say that all of that's true Mm -hmm. uh it's it's been absolutely wonderful um particularly on the switch because holy shit handheld diablo my life is over (laughs) (laughs) yeah um i know we've been playing it online a little bit um and it's been good you know no i haven't had any issues the only thing that kind of sucked was that it's not compatible with the nintendo online app so we've got to use discord to chat while we play yeah I'm surprised about that because I'm sure I read somewhere that it was supposed to be, but I, I just haven't seen an option anywhere for for that to actually work. So I don't know if that's a mistake or if we're just doing it wrong. But I'm a uh, little confused. It, is the Nintendo Switch Online app only for first party titles? No, it's it, it, any title is supposed to be able to use it, but it has to sort of specifically have a feature in it where in uh, the game you click start voice chat, and that that then connects to the app okay. via your Nintendo account. Um, so I don't know. There are there are plenty of third party titles that do use it. Okay. Um, and and like I say, I'm sure Diablo is supposed to be one of them. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure what the situation is on that offhand. But in the meantime, Discord worked absolutely fine. Oh yeah. No. Sort of no. using it on headsets and and I, I found that just using it through mobile on speakerphone works absolutely fine as well. So. Yeah, that's what I do. I put it in my put the, put my phone in my breast pocket and I just put it on yeah. the speakerphone. And- <laughs> It's been great. Yeah, so yeah, Diablo on Switch has been eating up a lot of my time, as well as Fist of the North Star. Um, trying to think what else I got for Christmas that I've really been enjoying the heck out of. Um, I got Tetris Effect. Oh, yes, tell me about this. So this is the um, the Q Games uh, Misaguchi-designed attempt at Tetris. 
So mm-hmm. it's basically everything you like about Luminous plus everything you like about Tetris. Sounds good to me. Um, I don't have PSVR, so I haven't experienced mm-hmm. the whole immersive virtual reality aspect of it. But essentially, to me, it's what I've been describing to people as like experiential Tetris. Yeah. So like, if you want like hardcore competitive technical Tetris, then um, Puyo Pop Tetris, Puyo Puyo Tetris is the way to go. Um, yes. If you want something that, besides being a video game, is a breathtakingly artistic, visual, and aural experience, then Tetris Effect is the way to go. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah. it's in, uh, uh, I, I keep saying it's Luminous, but not everyone's played Luminous, so let me explain that. Um, so you play Tetris, um, and there's basically levels. So in a traditional Tetris scheme of things, you, you play Tetris, and every time you hit the next level, you clear enough lines or hit the proper score, it advances to the next quote-unquote level. Usually that means the colors will change and the speed of the, that the Determinos drop will increase. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. In Tetris Effect, if you're playing the, the quote-unquote journey mode, um, not only does this happen, but it also radically alters the entire visual experience you're seeing. So there's animations in the background that will change. The music changes. The shapes and colors of the blocks themselves change, as well as the sound effects the blocks make when you drop. So there's mm-hmm. kind of a musical element to it as well. Um, yeah. When the blocks drop, when the blocks rotate, everything becomes new with each new stage. So the first level you play, it's got like an ocean theme and there's like manta rays swimming in the background. And um, once you fill enough lines, it ups the tempo of the music a little bit and it, big schools of silver fish come in. And it's just all a very like meditative and kind of beautiful experience um there's other levels that are extremely stressful because it's like fire (laughs) and like metal sounds and and rock and roll playing um and every level also has kind of a speed and a um kind of a, a pattern of blocks that will drop and requirements that are kind of loosely tethered to the theme you're playing as yeah um so like one level's a yin and yang level and the speeds will vacillate wildly between like speed 15 and then speed like three like <laughs> with, with like every 10 lines you clear or whatever yeah it's like to give you a break um because it's yin and yang like it's tied to the theme um yeah. it's just it's very difficult to fully describe what makes this game great because it's really just super basic tetris but the visual and aural presentation is just transportative there was one level that had me tearing up like just from the sheer like beauty of the presentation and the and mm-hmm. the music being incorporated with those visuals. So yeah, yeah highly recommend. Um, yeah, sounds great. I, uh, yes, that's one I, w- I want to pick up. This one I, I haven't sort of got around to really looking into yet. But uh, yeah, I do have PSVR, so I'm looking forward to. Oh yeah, seeing, it's seeing how all that's uh, implemented. Because um, yeah, some some of my favorite PSVR experiences are the more abstract ones. So yeah, I've talked a bit talked a bit about Jeff Minter's Polybius before. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a really good one, very abstract and yeah, the the sort of more meditative um, experiences are, are, are fit really nicely with PSVR. Sort of cutting yourself off from the world completely and just experiencing something completely different uh, from what you'd you get from reality. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, this yeah, isn't this a game. Like a, this isn't a game for people who can't appreciate the creative aspect of games. Yeah. Like if you're a gamer who's only focused on mechanics or only focused on achievements and you can't pick up a game and really get sucked into the, the art and the music, you're not going to get anything out of this. You're going to pick it up and be like, this is just Tetris. Like, cause it's, <laughs> cause it really, it's, it's just Tetris. It's, yeah. it's these presentational aspects that make it special. Yeah. Well, that sounds good to me, though. So, yes, I'll, I will be seeking out a copy of that, I'm sure. All right. Um, other thing cool. I have been playing recently is uh, the Atari Flashback Classics Collection. Oh, yes. Switch. Tell me about this. You went through quite a quest to get your hands on this. Oh, God, yes. So, um, to put this in context, the, the Atari Flashback Classics Collection uh, was previously released in two volumes on PS4 and Xbox One. Uh, by Atari. It was published in the in Europe by P Cube, 
who handle a lot of localizations but also a lot of indie games as well um then uh towards the end of last year uh, it was announced that there was going to be a third volume of these games uh for ps4 and xbox one uh, and also that there was going to be a complete collection of of all three volumes on one cartridge for switch uh, and apparently also vita as well but they kept that one very quiet uh, i think it might be digital only on vita for obvious reasons um but yeah so i asked p cube whether this would be coming to europe and they had no idea i tried to reach out to atari atari didn't respond because well you know um <laughs> i we have a long-running joke in our family about how atari handle marketing because they they have just never been good at it and like even with all the number of times the atari brand has passed through um you passed through different companies over the years so it's sort of been through infograms and various other places over the years the one thing that has constantly been passed down with the atari name is a complete inability to market anything that they do um and yeah that seems to have continued with this uh, so as far as i can make out um this switch release of atari flashback classics is uh, exclusive to north america uh and the physical run of it was limited because it seems to have sold out everywhere and there doesn't seem to be any estimate on it becoming available ever again yeah it's already rocketed up on ebay like i tried to get yeah. a copy too after you clued me in on it and i'm like already like i'm not spending 60 plus dollars for it <laughs> yeah so um, so I just tracked down a copy through a seller on eBay eventually because uh, Amazon had sold out. Uh, Target wouldn't ship to the UK. Uh, GameStop, they I outright IP block you from uh, accessing from outside the US, so I couldn't even see their site. Um, so yeah, I had to take to eBay. So I ended up paying a little bit over the odds for it, not by a huge amount, but uh, and the seller was kind enough to throw in free shipping to the UK as well, which I was pleased about. Um, and it arrived uh, surprisingly quickly. Uh, and so I'm now in possession of a lovely physical copy of this game for Switch. Um, and it contains uh, 150 games. Uh, so there are, I think, about 30 arcade games from Atari's uh, early years. And then the rest consist primarily of games for the Atari 2600. And there are, I think, about 15 uh, Atari 5200 games as well, which is from the, the, the console Atari made that not a lot of people remember. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have um, no no experience with that. Yeah, so the Atari 5200 was basically uh, the guts of an Atari 8-bit computer uh, without the computery bits. So, like, it didn't have sort of disc handling, the ability to have a keyboard and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's most known uh, among people today as having a really weird controller, um, which is sort of shaped like a TV remote. Um, it's got a non-centering analog joystick at the top. Um, it's got two fire buttons uh, on either side, so you can hold it with either hand. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and then it's got this telephone keypad type thing down at the bottom. And the telephone keypad, each game ships with a overlay for that, um, so that you can see what key does what. Uh, and in fact, um, it, this was such an integral part of the 5200 game design that all of the, the actual physical cartridges for the system, they had a little uh, notch on the back of them that you could put the overlays in. Oh, that's really cool. <laughs> Which is a really cool idea. Um, but yeah, so so the the additional buttons on this meant that the system could handle much more uh, sort of mechanically complex games than you typically expect from a console of the period. Um, and so we have things like um, like Star Raiders, which was available on the 2600. Um, but it's the the 5200, which is based on the Atari 8-bit version, is is significantly more complex. There's more functions you can get at with this keypad. Uh, you can sort of do things like control your speed. You've got all these different systems in your ship that you can control and turn on and off if you want to sort of um, improve your skills at being able to sort of track down enemies without using targeting computer and stuff like that. Um, and so yeah the the games on there are just are just really interesting and it's it, it's a significant release because this is as far as i'm aware the first ever time that these have been collected in any sort of compilation we've seen loads of 2600 compilations over the years from both atari and activision and a couple of other places but these 5200 releases they they've sort of been forgotten by history for um a lot of time which is one of the reasons i was i was very excited to see this new new collection come out uh, that and the j just having this this huge collection of games all in one place, all on one cartridge, is really good as well. Um, 
Now, not every one of those games is brilliant. Um, there are the sort of games that you you sort of question why you'd bother playing them. So, like this, it's like a it's like a basic maths game on the twenty six hundred and so on, which is literally just arithmetic. Um, there's a hangman game as well that sort of uses words with no longer than five letters, just because the twenty six hundred don't have enough mem memory to do it any longer that. than that. Growing yeah. up. <laughs> Although you say that, like even stuff like Hangman and stuff, what I found is that um, sort of the design of an Atari 2600 game actually makes it really, really good for handheld play. So oh, sort yeah. of if you, so sort of if if you've got um, sort of just a few minutes to spare and you want to play something and you don't want to take too long over it, and you don't want to sort of get involved in anything that's got hour-long cutscenes or you have to save your game or anything like that. Your average Atari 2600 game lasts two minutes and sixteen seconds. Um, exactly two minutes and sixteen seconds. This was a <laughs> precisely calculated measurement. It's, uh, I believe, it's. Um, I can't remember the exact calculation, but it's like two to the power of something or other, or eight thousand one hundred and ninety-two frames. And it's all to do with the sixty hertz refresh rate and trying to get as close as possible to this sort of um, magic number that they uh, Atari had figured out for their arcade games, where it feels like you've had a reasonably meaningful experience, but it doesn't sort of cause a big queue to form behind the machine, doesn't sort of uh, eat into arcade owners' revenue and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It was um, it was sort of sort of the, uh, considered to be the perfect amount of time for a single game in the period. And so, yeah, you can pick up a 2600 game, you can play it for just a couple of minutes like that and, and have a good time with it. And the same for the arcade games in there as well. So there's uh, there's some well-known stuff in there, there's st stuff that you'd expect to see. There's uh, things like Crystal Castles in there, it's is been on pretty much every Atari compilation over the years. But then there's, there's some more unusual stuff that I've not seen before as well. So there's things like Avalanche, uh, which is a, a paddle-based game where you're catching falling rocks from the top of the screen. Oh, that's neat, I never um, played that. No, I'd, I'd never played it before. Um, I, I, well, I had played something like this before, which was Activision's Kaboom, um, which it turns out Activision's Kaboom was a completely unauthorized ripoff of Avalanche hmm. because Atari didn't pull the finger out and do a 2600 version of Avalanche despite having sort of the perfect control schemes and stuff ready for it and despite good ports of things like Breakout and things being on the system and it obviously being based on the same basic system as Breakout was. Uh, but yeah, Atari never got an actual version of Avalanche out for their home console, so Activision just stuck in and thought, yeah, we can do that, but better. So they did. <laughs> um, what else is there? There's, um, there's some fun racing games that I'd never come across before. Atari's old racing games. Uh, these are all sort of top-down affairs. So there's um, Superbug and Fire Truck and what's the other one called? Monte Carlo, I think. They all play in basically the same way. So you have a car in the middle of the screen and um, you have an accelerator pedal and four gears. And all you have to do is just basically drive as far as you possibly can. And each one of them has a slight variation on the theme. So Superbug is probably the most simple of them in that you're just trying to uh, avoid smashing into corners and cars and uh, cars that are parked on the side of the road. There's no sort of opponents or anything in that one. Fire Truck is interesting in that you can play it two player, um, and the the two player mode means that the front and the back of the fire engine steer independently from each other. Oh, that's awesome! <laughs> so, so if you're playing it two player, you need to actually cooperate to make sure you're going around the corners properly, and otherwise you'll just sort of slide your back end out and stuff like that. And it's a, it's an absolute nightmare to play by yourself. <laughs> Um, and then Monte Carlo um, is, is is sort of the last evolution of that, so it's got slightly higher resolution graphics. Uh, it's got other cars driving around on the track as well that will cause you to spin out if you hit them, and so on, and a selection of different tracks to to learn and things as well. So, yeah, those those are games that I'd never come across or heard of before, but uh, they they're quite interesting to explore. Um, and it's yeah, it was all, it's also nice to see that some games that are probably best known as twenty six hundred games these days actually had their roots in the arcades as well. So there's things like Canyon Bomber, um, which is is a well known twenty six hundred game it, that had an arcade port. The twenty six hundred version is actually better because it's got more different game modes in it. But yeah, there is an arcade version of Canyon Bomber. There's an arcade version of Skydiver uh, as well, which I got worryingly addicted to the other night. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, these these games are they're just really simple, um, but they a lot of them hold up very very well indeed. They've got that sort of magic addictive quality about them that makes you just sort of want to keep trying to beat the high scores and so on. 
Um, and this collection is just set up really nicely to encourage you to experiment with them. It's got a big set of achievements to explore. So obviously the Switch doesn't have an online achievement system or anything like that, but they've kept an achievement system in this Atari Flashback Classics collection um, that just unlocks a bunch of badges for you. It doesn't do anything, but it gives you specific challenges to try for in a lot of these games. Um, including ways to play that you might not have considered before as well. So you can sort of look at these achievements and think, oh, I didn't know you could do that in that game, and then try it out for yourself and figure out that, oh, yeah, you can. The arcade games, they've all got online leaderboards as well. And with this being a fairly limited release that no one knows about, um, the leaderboards are... They're sparsely populated, but not so much so that it's sort of... Um, depressing to see how few people are playing if you know what i mean <laughs> yeah um they they are they are populated with enough people to make it competitive but also to give everyone a fair shot at getting the top spot um, yeah, it's and like so, a tight little community basically yeah so so like, there's a lot of the games where i'm like i'm i'm now the third best player in the world at skydiver for example um <laughs> so which is which is nice to see because it's yeah, I'd like online leaderboards, but if they get too heavily populated, it can just it can just feel a bit pointless because you're like, oh, I'm never going to get higher than six thousand seven hundred fiftieth or something like that. It's very, with this, it's a, it's almost more like being at the arcade and having an arcade machine's high score table there, so you yeah, know that cool. it's something you can beat. And the other nice thing about it is that unlike several of the other releases of these Atari games in the past, there doesn't appear to be any evidence of hacking or cheating either. That's good. Which, <coughs> which is always something I found particularly annoying with the because uh, uh, quite a while ago there was an iOS and Android release of um, like an earlier version of this pack. Okay. And the the leaderboards in that were absolutely just full of cheaters. It was it was and it was it just made them utterly pointless. Like who? So, like why? I don't know. Like, I don't like, know. <coughs> like I'll never understand. The thing is, it's it, they don't cheat with like a a plausible score either. They always like make it sort of like five or six digits longer than it's even possible to get in the game in a lot of cases. So it's so obvious, yeah, that they're cheating. And so it's it's obviously just an attempt to troll. But yeah, like I say, thankfully I've not seen any evidence of that on the Switch version, which is nice. So the actual leaderboards for these games seem to be proper proper people actually competing against each other and trying to take the top spot, which is really nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, I have a lot that's of fun uh, with that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, I, I I'm really enjoying it. I keep I, I keep finding myself going back to it, sort of when when I think they're sort of like, oh, I should I should get on with the telly, but maybe maybe just a, just a quick on a, on on Black Widow or something like that. And, mm. uh, yeah, my go-to yeah. game for that kind of stuff is still uh, Geometry Wars Three. I have Geometry Wars Three on the PS. Yes, four, yeah. and, and even though there's a physical version i've just always just had the digital version because i just always have it right there and it's like yeah 10 yeah. minutes before work or 10 minutes before dinner and there's what's great about geometry wars is that it's um there's two leaderboards there's a friends only leaderboard and a, yes. and a, and a global leaderboard it's like i never even look <clears> at the global <throat> leaderboard i'm just more yeah. interested in making sure i'm defeating everyone i know <laughs> yes yes i remember that's how geometry wars 2 handled it as well i, I had a, a real geometry wars 2 problem for a little while mm -hmm. and um that had the really horrific step of in the top right of the screen at all times you could see the, your closest friend to your current score <laughs> that's awesome i love that yeah and just so at all times you think oh right right if i can just if i can just survive a little bit longer i'll just be dead or whoever and uh yeah that just made you want to keep going back and try and oh bad times good times. <laughs> good bad times <laughs> yeah definitely all right anything else on your list you want to talk about uh, not really i think those the, the big stuff is fist of the north star and, and tetris and mm. diablo I, mean, I, I did get a bunch of other stuff for christmas i got that penguin wars oh yeah but it's just such a like a it's a lot of fun but it's just a goofy arcadey party game i don't really there's not yeah. much to talk about really yeah plus i don't really think i understand it enough to talk about it intelligently <laughs> yet that one's gonna take a little getting used to yeah yeah i only other thing i've been playing is i've been playing a bit of breath of the wild as well but oh uh, yeah I haven't i've not really got far enough in that to sort of comment on it in great detail yet but i'm enjoying what i've seen so far and i i have some some thoughts about um sort of the the differences between um sort of uh obviously the approach they've taken to open world design in that 
and the approach that we see in uh, a lot of Western games today. But I think we'll probably save that for an episode in itself. Because I was going to say, talk about that's that. a dense game to unpack. We could yeah. probably do a themed Breath of the Wild episode because yeah. it's also like the only Zelda game I've beaten in like 20 years. <laughs> like i like that game a lot yeah yes it is very good so i i will talk more about that when i've spent a bit more time with it but uh, i have uh, i have cute princesses to craft things with at the moment so mm. you know, nothing else again to look in <laughs> yeah well, your priorities right. are in the right place yeah okay let's take a short break then and then we'll come back and we'll talk a bit about what we're looking forward to in the coming year so see you in a moment Welcome back for our third segment with it being the first show of the new year for us we thought we'd talk a bit about some of the games that we were looking forward to in the coming year um so i think the first one i would like to bring up i've um i've sort of been following casually for a little while but uh, i've actually got really excited about it just recently in the last few days with some of the information that's been uh, released on it and that is uh death end request from compile heart oh yeah have you been following this at all? Is that the RPG from Compile Heart where like you're trapped in an MMO and it like glitches out and the combat yes. has like a like a physics base, like it's like billiards combat. You can like knock the characters around and stuff. Well, here's um, you, you, you you're sort of partially right. So yeah, it is it is based around the idea of um, sort of a, a system going wrong. So. Um, so here's the story from the website. So it says, World's Odyssey blended fantasy-based RPGs of the past with the splendor of modern technology. It put its developer Enigma on the cusp of industry notoriety. Just when the game's hype was reaching critical mass, its director, Shino Ninomiya, went missing, ceasing development on what seemed to be the most promising game of the decade. A year after the halt on development, the game suddenly resurfaced, albeit as a grotesque version of its former self. Inside the game, corruption took many forms, sometimes as bug-shaped monsters looking for prey, other times as an NPC flirting too closely to the human touch. Everything was being turned upside down. Um, and so basically, um, what it appears to be about is that you, you go in in search of this person who went missing. Oh, okay. Um, uh, uh, so, the, so the main character he wakes up inside this game, which is a, a VR MMO, basically. Um, and they're, they're not really sure why they're there, um and, and and that kind of thing so you're trying to sort of figure out um exactly what is happening with this game how people have got traps in it uh why it's um sort of going wrong uh and and, and what sort of the intention behind all these bugs are um so that's it, there's a bit of information about the story and characters on the official website at the minute but i think i think the most interesting things about it come in uh talking about the the system side of things Okay. And so, and so the the battle system uh, looks like a sort of, um, in basic terms, it looks like a, a, a sort of variation on how uh, a lot of the Neptunia and Fairy Fencer games have done things. So you've got sort of free movement around the battlefield, and you can trigger uh, events and that sort of thing. Um, you can do actions in bursts of threes, um, so sort of do three things at once, switch characters out from your party member, and so on. Um, this this sort of doing thing uh, doing actions three at a time seems to be a, a fairly key uh, a key part of it so if you sort of use the attack command multiple times it will be stronger or might have special moves and that sort of thing so um that's that's a basic part of it um yeah there is there is a knockback system in it which is, is what i think you're thinking of when you when we're talking about the sort of billiard style things yeah yeah so i've just when, seen footage of like people bouncing like all over the place yeah so the uh, you, you can knock things around and they'll if you knock one enemy into another they'll both take damage um but you, you can knock enemies into your allies as well and they'll do sort of follow-up attacks on them um oh, and cool. then there's, there's also these things called field bugs which are um s sort of representing the bugs in the game and they're sort of floating around the environment and they carry various negative effects as well so if you can knock enemies into those you will then pass on the um the negative effects to them 
but what's really really interesting about this is this system called Battlejack uh, which is one of the things they've announced a little bit more recently about it and so um, this it relates to um, so the, the character who appears to be the player character which is one of the programmers from this game and um, so, so he, he has various uh, abilities to manipulate the game uh, as a programmer would and so there's a thing called code jack where you can use sort of uh, cheat codes to manipulate the battlefield and the way things are happening oh cool um there are enemies that you can defeat and then sort of summon so, so sort of some of these some of these bugs there's large versions of them that you can defeat and then take control of um but if there's too many bugs in an area that you'll sort of lose control of them and so on and the most interesting thing i think is this thing called install genre have you seen this at all no but i'm no peaked. so it's <laughs> Inst install genre is literally what it sounds like so in the middle of battle if you think oh i don't want this to be an rpg anymore i'd rather this be a one-on-one -on -one fighting game you install the fighting genre and it becomes a one-on-one -on -one fighting game what yeah so um these genres you can install from the look of things you can turn it into a one-on-one -on -one fighting game you can turn it into a third person shooter you can turn it into a slot machine you can turn it into a puzzle game or you can outright turn it into a billiards game <laughs> And there's there's sort of different um, different uses for each of those. So, for example, they they cite the example of if you're facing an enemy that's very fond of hitting you in the back, um, and, and sort of moving around you and hitting you from vulnerable points. If you then switch in the fighting game, they can only face you at all times, and so right, they can't that do sense. that anymore. Yeah, that's so cool. <laughs> And so, uh, and like like the shooter thing, um, it sort of allows you to take out a large group of enemies because it, it sort of just switches in for like a, a brief amount of time. Uh, it sort of uses one of the, what looks like it uses one of the resources the characters have got to sort of trigger this. And then you've got like a few seconds to shoot as many things as you can at the time. The slot machine, I presume, will work like something like um, sort of Kate Sith does in Final Fantasy VII. Mm -hmm. um, the puzzle genre, um, that's basically a thing where you, you are dropping blocks and making lines and things and the the various colors of the blocks that you you do will have different effects so like if you match the um if you match the green blocks then it will buff your attack power but if you match the yellow blocks it will decrease your attack power so you need to sort of plan out your strategy with that carefully and so on so yeah this just looks this just looks so cool yeah and it's just wow. such such a great idea and i'm really looking forward to trying this idea factor is really poised to kill it this year yeah um, cause we had, t we've talked about it multiple times in previous episodes, but like on my list of stuff to talk about today is Ark of Alchemist, yep, which yep. is supposed to come out in August. That's the action RPG that look kind of has a bit of an East feel to it with those QC yes. chubby characters yeah. in a post-apocalyptic setting, um, with a, also a town building element, which then also will reflect your abilities and your like the attacks you can do, the items you have access to. So like as you build up your fortress, there's also like a, I think there's a bit of like a defense element to like protect yep. your fortress. Yep. Um, so like that's coming from Idea Factory, mm -hmm. Death End Request, um, Varnier Dragon Star, which yes. also looks really, really cool. And uh, we also just got this week, they announced a Switch version of um, Fairy Fencer F, Advent Dark Force. Yes, yes. Ghostlight um, have been working on that, and they are, they are very good at ports. So, um, yeah, that will be a good version of that. So, um, And that's one that I've covered in detail on Moe Gamer in the past as well. So if you want to know about that, there are a lot of words for you to read and find out about that. That's a really cool game. I really enjoyed that one. So, Yes, I mean, we're talking four games <laughs> for, of Compile Heart and Idea Factory. Yeah. stuff and all each one radically a different concept it's not just yeah. kind of the same thing yeah it's it's interesting I, I i get i get the impression i think they might be trying to move past neptunia yeah for um, sure because um i know the the super neptunia rpg is now out in japan i don't think it's been selling very well which has been causing a lot of people to sort of get all doomsayer on i was like mm. oh compile heart need to do something it's like have you seen what else they've got coming no they don't need to do anything they're absolutely fine yeah <laughs> yeah well, that's interesting when you think about it right so the only neptunia game we're getting this year is um outsourced yeah like they didn't even make it they're just publishing yeah. it so yeah it does sound like they're probably i mean goodness knows they've milked that cow <laughs> like i don't need yes. any more neptunia like i love it i love neptunia but i don't need any more there's yeah. a, there's enough yeah yeah i i i think 
I, I don't want to say they sort of wrapped up the story as such, but I think with um, with the way the narrative of Mega Dimension went, which was mm -hmm. all about they sort of change over between generations and so on, I think I think that would be a, a, a sort of fitting point for them to at least take a break from it um, and sort of see how things develop from there. Um, because I, I mean, Neptune is at its best when it's sort of responding to things that are going on when it when it's being properly satirical, mm -hmm. um, and so I. I just don't think there's there's quite enough that it can really satirize at the moment um in terms of sort of big things i mean it, it could get into this, this sort of um sort of industry trends with things like uh, sort of sociological criticism and so on but i don't think that's really the direction they want to go with that game um it, it's mostly focused on sort of the trends in hardware and development and stuff like that mm -hmm. and I, I just think they they sort of need something significant to happen for um for there to be something really good for them to satirize at that point so i do might need well there be... to be a switch girl though like, yes at least at least get sonako on <laughs> making a switch <laughs> like i feel yes. it's necessary yes i'm sure that will happen at some point but uh yeah like i say yeah the the those those three games that we've mentioned there they, they are all looking absolutely great um death and request is the one that's coming first i think you're actually able to pre-order that very soon at the time of recording um i think on the psn store um there is a there is apparently a season pass for it but from the sound of things um I, I, going by past experience with idea factory and compile heart games the actual dlc will won't be anything really super substantial so it's not going to be the sort of season pass that you're really missing out on much if you don't decide to pick it up i don't know sometimes they do full on playable characters um yeah i guess so so there might be playable characters more often than not it, it, it is just costumes and maybe a couple of extra events rather yeah. than like a, a full expansion or anything and like, like cheat so. and like cheat items like the, like like this piece of armor triples your experience items like stuff like yeah. that that's that, that's that's a trend in rpgs generally these days because like namco are all over that with tails as well like tails you can outright buy level ups yeah. <laughs> yeah. um so yeah but but i mean as long as that stuff isn't interfering with the thing as long as it's as long as it's not stuff that you actually need to get to get the full experience out of the game I'm, I'm i'm fine with that really for sure um so yeah so i believe um like towards the end of that month uh, towards the end of january you should be able to uh pre-order death and requests and then the other ones will follow shortly and uh, i'll be very surprised if there isn't some sort of nice limited edition for that as well so yeah i'll be watching out for that Okay, so I, I think that's that's the one that's sort of most readily sprung to mind uh, for me recently. So, so what have you got on your list? Um, my big one, uh, well, first of all, I want to drop a quick shout out. It's not really a 2019 launch, but it was a 2018 launch. But um, uh, pre-orders are opening next Friday um, at Limited Run for Iconoclasts. Oh, yes. yes. Which um, is one of my most anticipated games for years and i've held off for a physical version so this is as far as i'm concerned a 2019 launch mm -hmm. um uh iconoclast is kind of a big side scroller with gorgeous pixel art from uh konjak uh joaquin sandberg who's most famously known for uh the noitu love series which is a great series of side scrollers um, and in the indie sphere, I would say that Konjak is perhaps arriving closest to the feel of treasure games more mm -hmm. than anyone else. Yeah. Um, his games are a breathtakingly beautiful, just like pixel art of the highest caliber and B just play so tightly and they're so rewarding. And he has such a unique focus on, um, like these tremendous bombastic mechanically interesting boss battles which has always kind of been treasure's thing and um yeah. that's how uh that is how iconoclast is set up i think there's something like 20 plus bosses overall it's like crazy <laughs> um so um the switch version is going to be a pre-order so for people who don't like limited runs um timed uh launch order process um their switch games are pre-order so yeah if you want the switch version of iconoclast you'll have a full two weeks to order it if you're interested mm -hmm. um so i just wanted to give a shout out to that um besides that i think my most anticipated game for this year will be out before the end of the month which is into creates <laughs> uh into creates dragon marked for death oh yes yes that um, is looking lovely um 
that is a new IP from Into Creates from the teams responsible for the Mega Man Zero series and most recently Azure Striker Gunvolt mm-hmm. um, with a kind of weird, st- highly stylized fantasy medieval setting. Um, it looks to me, and I hate to be the guy who describes always describes games of like, it's this plus this, but it, <laughs> it, it really is like... Um, Looks a lot like Vanillaware's Dragon's Crown, but as a side scroller instead of a beat 'em up. Yeah. Yeah. So you you pick your class. There's four classes to pick from: the Empress, which is kind of like the standard melee DPS character. There's a warrior with defense and healing powers. A ninja who's kind of focused on acrobatics and speed, and a magician who's super vulnerable but like can dish out powerful spells. Um, if you opt for the digital version, which is launching on January 1st, uh, it's split up into two packs. So um, you can either buy the Empress and Warrior pack for $14.99 or the Wizard and Ninja Advanced pack, because they're harder characters to use for $14.99. Um, there has also been promised a physical release that will be both packs combined. So that's obviously yeah. what I'm going to be holding out for. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. Given our recent experiences enjoying Diablo and um, Smash Brothers online together, I'm, I'm thinking this will be something we can enjoy yes. multi- multiplayer in a Very big way. Um, so it's just a gorgeous pixel art side scroller from Into Creates, which is what they do well, um, but with RPG uh, trappings. So you you'll choose your character class, you'll level them up. There's loot to be had. You go on quests, uh, on you know unlock abilities. Um, big bosses, pretty environments, um, all with the, their kind of signature design style. Really beautiful yeah. colors and characters. So that's that's my like, gotta have it game. <laughs> that's coming up very soon. <laughs> um, was there anything else for you that was um, super I, big? I've actually been been sort of struggling to think about stuff that's sort of in the in the future it's like the only one that springs to mind in sort of the very near future again is uh, ace combat 7 oh yeah for sure i was thinking you're probably looking forward to that one yeah yeah ace combat is a series that i've i've discovered relatively recently um and and sort of regret not playing back in the ps2 days now but ace combat is so good just because it sort of combines um the things that I enjoyed about military flight simulators back on sort of the Atari ST in the early days of PC gaming, and then it combines it with sort of the this sort of really over the top dramatic, um, the, the sort of Japanese way of doing things with this yeah. kind of well, thing. So it's, sort of re- it's anime dogfighting. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, but I mean, I mean, it's quite interesting as well because the the early the earlier installments in the series they don't really sort of play up the the sort of character centric side of things, but sort of the the actual combat sequences are ridiculous. So, like in Ace Combat Four, which is the first one on the on the um, on the PS2. The final mission in that one, um, you are taking on uh, this super weapon called Megalith. And Megalith is like this giant cannon that they're going to fire and blow everything up for reasons not entirely clear. Uh, but the way you defeat Megalith is you go into an absolute trench run in it. <laughs> yeah, like Star in, in, Wars style. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You, you, it's sort of you're flying inside this thing with in, in a plane. So, like... It's not like in a space sim where if you go wrong, you can sort of stop and turn around and that sort of thing. No, you are flying a plane. So if you're if you're flying towards a wall, you're going to fly into that wall. So yeah, it, but um, one remember- of the best things one of the best things about Ace Combat is its music. So like this this finale for Ace Combat Four just has some of the most astounding music. It's got um, so it, it sort of has. Um, a very distinctly Namco style to a lot of it, quite quite an arcadey Namco mm-hmm. feel. So, sort of the mission briefing screen, it's got lots lots of sort of slap bass and arcadey. Oh, you're about to go into combat music, uh, but the last mission they replace that music with just like this really low bassy drone that comes out your speakers and this sort of heartbeat sound and it's it's just a clear audible signal that just goes. This is the final mission. You are probably going to die. And then you get into the mission, and it's just, it's full orchestra. It's a choir singing in Latin. It's its just going all completely balls out of the music. It's like <laughs> the, sort, the sort of music you would expect from a JRPG, and it's just ridiculous. And you are flying a plane inside this thing and dropping bombs on a thing, and 
Oh, it's it's amazing. And if, if they capture even half of the ridiculousness that the PS2 games had in Ace Combat 7, I'm going to be very, very happy indeed. Oh, and early, impression, early impressions from what I've heard so far seems to be very, very positive indeed. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm also looking forward to trying it in VR as well. I don't, mm, I don't yeah. yet know if you can play the whole game in VR, but just, just, just a bit of Ace Combat in VR will be enough for, to make me very happy indeed. So, yeah, looking forward to that one a lot. Mm. yeah i just remember some of my earliest exposure to ace combat and i uh i had this friend jim and he was he's japanese and he would always import like everything yeah and uh, so i would always get to see stuff like super ahead of time because jim would always have the import version and i remember walking in on him one day and he was playing one of like the maybe ace combat four or five and it was one Mm -hmm. of like the one of the ridiculous like this is not a real thing <laughs> fights like some kind of like base or like enemy satellite thing with like tentacles and like armor plating and i'm like <laughs> i remember walking in on it and not knowing what he was playing and i when i asked him if it was a new zone of the enders like it, <laughs> it, was, like, it was like like i was like is this the new zone of the enders can you turn into a plane now yeah. like i was <laughs> yeah i just assumed yeah. it was some like sci-fi thing that that sounds like it might be five because the, the last mission in five, um, you, there, there is a there is a satellite crashing and it's like a nuclear equipped satellite and it's about to crash into this city, and so there's this satellite falling out of the sky and you you're you're there with your squadron of planes trying to intercept it before it lands on this city, and the the music and the background of that is like is like this this piece of music that's been built up throughout the course of the game is the national anthem for the um for the country that you're representing <laughs> and it's just like oh my god i want to cry right now <laughs> i love that kind of stuff and like like motifs <laughs> return that have been playing in the background for like the yeah. past 15 hours of your life yeah oh i love it so yeah I, i'm pretty excited to check seven out too I also, like, I've been kind of going back and collecting PS2 games lately, mm-hmm. and, and Ace Combat is definitely on my radar of stuff to, to get to fill that. That's a yeah, big definitely. gap in my collection. It's not a series I have a lot of experience with. Yeah. The thing I'm interested about with in Ace Combat is I've, play, I've played 4 and 5 so far. Everyone is constantly telling me, it's like, oh my god, you need to play Zero. Zero is the best one. And I haven't played that yet. So, Which one yeah. is Zero? Zero is Zero is actually the one that came out sixth. So it's it's like a prequel to uh, four and five, basically. Okay. So I, I I don't know how familiar you are with 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 Ace Combat, but like a big thing a big thing that they did from about the I think probably about the third one onwards is they set it in this very very well realized um, setting. It's a I do know th- I do know that that like the nations yeah. and the history it's all like super fleshed out. Yeah, so so it's a fictional setting, but it's it's very much based on reality. It's called Strange Real, um, and so you can draw sort of obvious parallels between certain certain areas in this this Strange Real world and the real world. Um, but like, there's there's no real countries or anything like that. It, it's just countries that sound like they should be real countries. Um, but if you look into the lore and stuff like this world has got proper myths and legends in it and so on so like a big significant part of five's plot is that um the 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 kind of course that you and your pilots take throughout the game is sort of mirroring this legend of this legendary creature called the rasgris and so by the end of the game your squadron is called rasgris squadron just because everyone is sort of considering you to be the reincarnation of this ancient um this ancient mythological being i love it and it's I yeah, can't it's, get enough. It's just so good. Oh my god! I need to go and play those games again right now. I might have to boot them up after we're, we're done recording here. That's so um, exciting. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Uh, d- d- this this is why um, a site co- uh, a. Ace Combat Assault Horizon got so much shit when it was released because um, they took it out of this setting, they took it out of Stranger, and they set it in the real world. Uh, and people were like, "What? What, what are you? What are you doing? <laughs> so <laughs> what are you which, doing? Why which you one was that?" that? So, so that, is Zero also on PS2? Yeah, Zero is the last one they did on PS2. Assault Horizon was, I think... Uh, I can't remember if it was the first or the second one they did on uh, 360 and PS3. Because they, they did six on uh, 360. Okay. Um, and then Assault Horizon, I think, was... That was sort of big in the era when uh, things like Call of Duty and stuff were starting to get really popular. Uh, and 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 so it was obviously an attempt to sort of jump on the real world military trend. 
Yeah. Uh, so they, so they, they said, I mean, it was good. It was enjoyable. It, and in fact, it was the first Ace Combat game I played, and it made me want to play the rest of the series. So it's not a bad game in itself. But having played the others now, I can understand why people who had be, become so attached to this uh, this setting would be a bit pissed off with it. But so it, if it, I were to collect, look into collecting, I would want to get four, five, zero on the PS2, yep. and and probably six on the 360. Yes, and possibly uh, three on PS1 as well. Oh, okay. Um, is uh, three is sort of I, I think that's one where they sort of really started to establish the lore of the world, uh, and one of the characters in it is related to uh, Reiko Nagase from Ridge Racer. That's awesome. So, so canonically, Ace Combat and Ridge Racer unfold in the same universe. That makes me <laughs> extraordinarily happy. Because <laughs> now I want to unlock the hidden lore of Ridge Racer. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, God. Nam- Nam- Namco are good at the side of things. Like, it's like, have you ever looked into Dig Dug lore? No, I can honestly say that I have not. Uh, the concept I, that there might even be Dig Dug lore is not something no, that's ever crossed there, my there mind. There is, there is Dig Dug lore. Let me, let me, let me. I know we're getting way off the point here, but oh no, this is this is a worthwhile diversion. Continue. Let me, ju- let me just look this up because I, I remember where I was just writing about Dig Dug. And I thought oh, I'll just look into this. Where did is what, what's that character called? Um, so uh, where are we? So um, the the main do you, well for starters, do you know what the name of the main character in Dig Dug is? I'm assuming based on you asking me this question that it is not Dig Dug. No, it is not Dig Dug. His name is Hori Taizo. Okay. Um, and that is a pun on a Japanese phrase that means I want to dig. Okay. Um, he is the father of Mr. Driller. Okay. Uh, and he is the ex-husband of uh, the main character from Baraduke. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> ex, I love it specifically. He's the ex-husband. Like it didn't. Like it didn't work out. <laughs> uh, yeah, but yeah, yeah. So, so Nam- Namco has been doing this shit for a long time. I love they, it. they they just know that there there will be people out there who will look into this thing and go, oh, that's interesting. And here we are. <sighs> I couldn't. Anyway, can't, can't, can't get enough of that kind of stuff. <laughs> Definitely not. Uh, okay, so for you, pretty much Ace Combat. I have a whole list here. <laughs> yeah, go for it. So, Dragon Mark for Death. Um, super stoked for the PS4 releases of the Trails of Cold Steel 1 and 2. Oh, yes, definitely. I've never played these games. Cannot wait. Uh, one drops on 2.12. Um, two drops on 3.19. Um, can't wait. Japanese voice tracks are implemented in the new versions. Um Love me some Falcom. Um, another huge one for me this year. Uh, pretty much everything's really front loaded into like the first quarter. Mm. But um, Etrian Odyssey Nexus on, oh, yes. the, on the 5th of February. Um, I'm a huge Etrian Odyssey fan, and this is it. This is like the, the definitive Etrian Odyssey. Everyone's back. 19 playable classes in total. Um, it is promised to be the most content rich and like it's like the only dungeon crawler you'll ever need yeah. like in terms of like classes and, and like breadth of content um super excited about that uh we covered arc of alchemist i'm also really excited for that new from software game uh, sekiro shadows oh, die yes. twice yeah um because it basically looks like um you know i i love a good ancient japanese mythological setting so mm-hmm. at first when it was announced i thought it was just going to be like uh, like a hard history setting but now i've been yeah. watching footage and like you have a mechanical arm that can do cool stuff and there's ogres and monsters so it's a, it's a really cool uh really cool setting and it, to me it seems to be taking a lot of what i like about dark souls which is a highly technical combat um but with um splashes of tenchu which is really something you know I, I really miss tenchu as a mm. series which is yeah. also from from software um you know, I, I miss the verticality, um, and that's also something I've always thought was kind of missing from the Souls games. Um, yeah. But Sekiro, you can climb over ledges, go on rooftops. There's a grappling hook. You can jump up in the air in like Spider-Man style, that like like chain grappling hooks together, to, like vault across spaces. So really, really interested to see kind of how they mesh that kind of 
difficult but fair approach to like mortality of your characters that they've become famous for championing in their games with kind of a a, a, a greater freedom of movement and and this interesting setting. So that's supposed to come out in March, once again, um, pretty close to the beginning of the year. Um, and then the last game I have down is that new game from uh, Nipponichi, that uh, Lap- Lapis Cross Labyrinth. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's looking cool. Because um, to me, it appears to be kind of fusing the insanity of Disgaea, the like huge numbers everywhere, just absolute chaos, um, with a side-scroller. Mm-hmm. Which is kind of something that I've always kind of fantasized about in a lot of ways. Like a, a side-scroller with RPG elements with Disgaea's signature, like, overblown approach to everything. Like, it yeah. could be a really good time. And the art is really charming. Um, and that's f- scheduled for late May, I think, at this point. Mm-hmm. Pre-orders are open for it. Um, I've only seen pre-orders open for a limited edition, though. I haven't seen pre-orders open for a standard edition, so I don't know. Yeah if there's going to be a standard edition in physical or not. But, uh, yeah, that's another one that's really caught my eye. So that's that's my stuff. That's the stuff that has, like, definitive release dates, right? Yeah. Like, I'm sitting here, like, maybe Death Stranding? I don't know. But, like, no, <laughs> the, the game's never coming out. Um, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's my big stuff for this year. Um, I mean, most of it will be out before before even half of the year is over, with the exception of Ark of Alchemist. I think that's scheduled for August. Um, so there's still plenty of room for surprises, certainly. Um, I know I know Namco says they're going to be announcing a new Tales relatively soon, but I don't know mm-hmm. if that'll make 2019 or not. It would be great yeah. if it made holiday 2019. But now we're just kind of in speculation territory. Yeah. Hopefully, Bloodstain drops in 2019. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Shenmue 3 is supposed to. Yeah, I was going to say Shenmue is supposed to be this year as well, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So that'll be good if that happens. Um, I'm sure there's loads of, like, indie stuff, too, that's, like, I've been following that's that I can't think of right now. But I know um, that The Messenger that came out last year that was quite well regarded, that, like, ninja side-scroller... the um, special reserve games, which is Devolver Digital's limited printing publishing house, is going to be doing a physical pressing of that in 2019. All right, cool. So I'm very much looking forward to getting my hands on that one. Yeah. Um, but I think that's pretty much it for me. Cool. Yeah. I've, I've got a lot of stuff I, I'm looking forward to playing this year, but a lot of it is, is just stuff that I've I've bought a while back and still yeah. haven't got around to yet. So, um, yeah, so I, I could probably go on for hours if we start listing those, but I, I will yeah. spare you that for the minute. But, no, uh, for sure. The Christmas stack is... <laughs> cause real, yes. my, yeah. My birthday is in October. So between mm. uh, money I got for my birthday and stuff, like holiday bonuses at work and Christmas, from October through to december i've probably gotten between 20 and 30 games (laughs) it's disgusting like i feel bad i feel bad about myself (laughs) i'm never i'm never gonna play like most of them are massive rpgs yeah like fist of the north star alone is gonna take me at least what 40 50 hours to really get anything thorough out of and and that's and that's derailed me from Dragon Quest XI, which is mass. Like, that's what I was playing before I got derailed by Fist of the North Star. So, like, <laughs> those two games alone are probably enough for me to not have to touch anything else in 2019. Yeah. But here I am, buying so much crap anyway. Like, I got Mar- the new Mario, the Super mm-hmm. Mario Brothers U, I got that yesterday. And yep. Tales, Tales of Vesperia mm-hmm. Definitive. And yep. uh, I'm, I'm definitely getting Travis Strikes again next week. Because yes. it's, it's a new No More Heroes, and there's no way in hell I'm going to pass up that. Yeah. So, so yeah, I, I I will probably grab that just to su- just to support it. But I I I want to play the the No More Heroes games and get familiar with with those characters in that setting before I I jump into Travis Strikes again because I, I I have those on Wii, but I've not explored those yet. We've talked mm. a bit previously about how I I don't have a huge amount of experience with uh, with Suda stuff, but uh, yeah, definitely definitely interested in getting into it. I just haven't made time to do that yet. Yeah, 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 me too. Uh, I mean, I, I have played No More Heroes, and I'm very fond of the series. 
But um, it was so long ago that I've probably forgotten more about it than I'll ever remember <laughs> without <Yeah>. replaying it. <laughs> but yeah, Travis Strikes Again is looking like some high quality weird shit. Yes. Like, I don't even know, like, every time I see, like, there's a news announcement, it's like, hmm, Travis Strikes Again, also to include coffee mug donut mini game side scroller levels like yeah what? i was gonna say there seems to have been a lot of sort of announcements recently it's like hey this game has also got something completely different in it you're like yeah what? <laughs> well, like that's like i guess travis strikes again whole deal is that you're trapped in a video game console yeah so you are yeah. playing through the different games that are available on the console yeah like as travis and like there's like genre play involved yeah. so I don't know. It's going to be weird, and, and well, it's a Suda game, so it's going to be <laughs> it's going to be special. Yes, we're looking forward to that. Yeah. All right. Anything else? No, I think that's it for me. All right. Yeah, I think I'm I'm good for the minute now as well. So, yeah, lots to look forward to. Lots we are currently enjoying. So yeah, it's a good time to be playing. <laughs> All right. So, as usual, would you like to tell people where to find you online? Yes, uh, you can always see my artwork at uh, MrGilderPixels.com or on Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram as MrGilderPixels. That's M-R-G-I-L-D-E-R-P-I-X-E-L-S. Um, always posting fresh artwork and work in progress stuff, so love to hear from you guys. Excellent. And you can find most of my stuff on MoeGamer.net. That's where I write articles most days of the week. Um, I've now got videos going live most days of the week as well on the YouTube channel that you may be uh, watching or listening to this on. So uh, at present, uh, Mondays, um, it, it tend to be when we release the podcast on there. But I'm also going to try and do a few more feature videos uh, on Mondays as well if I can find time to do that. Uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays and Saturdays are now the Atari A to Z videos. So Tuesdays are Atari 8-bit games. Thursdays are Atari ST games. And Saturdays are, I'm going through the Atari Flashback Classics collection that we talked about earlier, uh, a game at a time. So if you want to find out a bit more about those games, their history and how they play, then check those out. Wednesdays is Warriors Wednesday. So I'm playing Warriors of Rochi at the moment. As I say, I may sort of start a companion series with Dynasty Warriors 8 XL as well alongside that because I do want to get stuck into that and have a look at how that does things. Uh, Fridays is New Game Plus. Uh, we're coming towards the end of my Project Zero New Game Plus run at the moment on Nightmare Mode. Um, so a couple more ghosts to catch on that at the time of recording. Um, what else? Saturday... What happens on Saturdays? I've already talked about that. That's Atari A to Z. And Sunday is Sunday Driving, which at the time of recording, we are playing Split Second, which is one of my favorite racing games of all time. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much everything, I think. So, as always, thank you very much for watching and or listening, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please help out the channel by leaving a like or a comment and subscribing. Be sure to check out moegamer.net for new articles on Japanese and Japanese inspired video games, new and old, every weekday. Every month, Moegamer features an in depth exploration of an individual game or series as its cover game, so be sure to check the archives to see if your favourite has had a deep dive yet. If you'd like to support the site directly, please consider becoming a patron or buying me a coffee. You can find links to do both down in the video description. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.